Oh. <laughs> Roast beef without the mustard. <laughs> Hello from the land of snot. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You're listening to Mystery Maniacs. I have not been this sick in 19 years, we figured out last night. No, you haven't. And I was sick first. Yeah. Ugh. And then I gave it to you. Luckily, I got better. The week of sick. Just as you got sick. Luckily, it's spring break for us too. So Yay. I wasted two holidays. <laughs> what a great use of spring break. Oh. I will give you credit, though. You have not had man flu. You're not one of those people. Some men are like, oh, I'm so I'm going to die. You no, know, you're you've been great. You've been a good patient. I've been no, happy to take I, care of you. I have a head cold. It's annoying. <laughs> you have been leaving Kleenex around, though. <laughs> It's hard not to when I blow my nose all the time. Yeah. But that's why we didn't make an episode last week. It would have just been sniffling and sneezing and moaning, and that now, wouldn't have been fun to listen to. I'm also to. very over waking up with a splitting headache. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope that, um, that you all haven't caught this thing. Yes. So just to... Reiterate. We're both on the upswing now. We are both on the upswing. This is Mystery Maniacs, comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. This week, Poirot, Four and Twenty Blackbirds, Season 1, Episode 4. I'm Mark. I'm Sarah. Don't let your kids watch this episode if they can't see boobs, because wow. There's a lot of boobs. 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 This is one of my favorite Poirots. It's the most Poirot-y Poirot ever. If there's a Poirot knob that you can turn up, I think it's set to about nine. And oh, that's uh, the way I like it. It's pretty close to 11. <laughs> Originally, air date is January 1989, the 29th of January, and directed by Rennie Rye and written by Russell Murray. Before we dive in, though, did you want to talk a little bit about the next couple of weeks? Yeah. So this week, so this comes out on the 18th of March. So you're all listening on Monday, 18th of March. And uh, we're doing four and 20 Blackbirds. And then we got to take a week off because I'm going to a comic book convention. Well, I'm I'm tabling at a comic book convention. Mm -hmm. And so we can't record that weekend. Much to the surprise of my wife who said, that's next weekend. Oh, oh is that why you've been getting all that stuff ready in the other? Oh, okay. So we'll release our next episode after this. The 1st of April, which will be the third floor flat, an awesome episode that we love. Mm -hmm. And that will be episode 199 because this is episode 198. That's and, how numbers work. Yes. And then April will be regular, though there will be two remix in episodes in it because the sun is going to stop shining. Yes. On the 8th of April, we will release an episode. We we cannot, like, Bloomington has roughly between 60 and 70,000 people in it when the students are here. Mm -hmm. And they are expecting 300,000 people in our town. Extra. Extra. To show up for the eclipse. There's, there will be nigh on half a million people here. Yeah. Which will be insane. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to be crazy. <laughs> I do a convention that Saturday, but I should be able to remix an episode for you on Monday and have it all ready to go. Maybe there will be a murder during the eclipse. Maybe. Maybe. Like on Guy Fox uh, and Poirot. So we have next week off, and then the 1st of April, you'll hear all about our 200th anniversary, 200th episode, Ask Me Anything Ask us anything, details. We'll have a date and all yeah, that yeah, yeah. crazy stuff. Then. I'm looking so, forward to that. It's going to be fun. Uh, it's, it, it'll really be tea with the maniacs because <laughs> we're just going to sit down and talk. Uh, we're not going to talk about a specific episode. Um, Though we uh, may have some favorite moments or something. We, we might have some favorite moments. And uh, a couple of people have asked some stuff already that Great. I want to cover. So, so get your questions in mind and... Uh, We'll deal with that when it comes. So, boy, 
this episode. The other thing about this episode, it's very Poirot. Mm -hmm. It's it's Poirotiest. <laughs> if that's <laughs> if that's an adjective, it's Trey Poirot. It's also wicked expensive. Mm -hmm. There are a ton, a ton of actors in this episode that have no bearing on the plot. Yeah. And a ton of extras. Yeah. And the the pure logistics of this episode. Because they actually shoot at Brighton. They That's actually, actually Brighton Pier. They shoot. Which a lot of filming happens at Brighton, but period filming at Brighton takes a whole nother level of prep. So the very first shot, we see the Brighton Pier. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of people in period costume. Yep. Except for one dude. Yeah. <laughs> Who's in a panic trying to get he's out of shot. In a panic because he's trying to get out of shot. He literally launches himself over the, like, the there's wall. a fence that yeah. leads to the ocean and he jumps over it. Yeah. He dives out of shot. Yeah. Like, this really, I remember seeing in the documentary about Poirot that Hastings in particular played by Hugh Fraser particularly was like when they showed up to start filming. They were like, wow, th this is money. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. There, this, These are, this first 10 episodes, except for Johnny Waverly, are 10 little movies. Yeah. Like. Well, and never mind the extras at the theater too. All of the dancing girls and the actors and their costumes and all of that stuff. There's, just, there's a lot going on. There's just. There's vaudeville numbers yes. <laughs> that have nothing to do with the plot. There's a magician with a girl in a box. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe the worst doctor ever. Okay, if I'm lying in bed, barely able to breathe, I do not want my doctor to walk four feet away and tell my maid, yeah, he's going to die in a couple hours. <laughs> Gee, thanks, doc. Could you have taken her out of the room or something? <laughs> Like, please keep so, it from me a little so bit. This is the story of a family. Mm -hmm. We have two brothers. Yes, Arthur we, and Henry Gascoigne. And there must be a third sibling that we don't know about who is dead. Yeah, who has the son, George, who's their nephew. And George is their nephew. The t they're twin brothers. It seems like these are the only three people from this clan left. Th yeah, the only Gascoigne's remaining. Yes. Now, Arthur had a wife, but she died mm -hmm. after being painted naked Anthony. by the other... Anthony, sorry. Yes. Anthony had a wife... Charlotte. ...who got painted naked by the brother. Yeah. And that's why they don't talk. Right. There's a lot of naked... <laughs> There's a lot of naked ladies in this. Hastings is quite mature. He really holds it together. <laughs> He does, and when they're in the when they're looking down on Dulcie Lane, and she's completely naked, like not here's a painting naked. Mm -hmm. It's actual actually the woman naked. Woman naked. Poirot takes a long, lingering look at that naked lady. Yeah, but you know, it, I expect Hastings' eyes to be oh god, god. the whole episode <laughs> when they when they're in Henry's. Uh, studio, there's like life size portraits of her naked everywhere, and she's standing right there among them. And yeah. Henry uh, uh, Hastings isn't like drooling or something. And she has the auburn hair. This is like Hastings it, should be going crazy. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Anthony Gascoigne dies in Brighton. Yes. He lives in Brighton. He can look right out on the pier from his bedroom, apparently. Apparently. So his maid, Mrs. Hill, calls. George, the nephew, yes, in London, yes, and says he's dying, and he says, "Well, I can't get there till like Sunday." Now the doctor says they're twins, but they're not identical, right? Can you do no, that with same-sex twins? The nephew says that. Yeah, of course you can. Oh, there's you can. two eggs, two okay. sperm. They okay. can be either okay sex. Yeah, I wasn't sure. You just can't, and you can even have odd numbers of fraternal twins. Okay, you just can't have odd numbers of identical unless okay. something's gone wrong. Well. Multiples. It's a whole weird world. I know all about oh, it. Oh, I know we know all about it. So George is their nephew. He's the nephew of Henry and Arthur. Yeah. That's what that's the only thing I can figure out. He is neither of their sons. No, he can't. Which be. means well, there has to be a third sibling, but that we don't know to, who that is. Yeah. Okay. Hastings is all about cricket, especially yeah. at the most inappropriate times. He is <laughs> all about cricket. I'm surprised he's not talking about it at the funeral. 
<laughs> if he could have had a little ear radio, he would have like, and there's a wicket and somebody's having a tea break and <laughs> there's a bowl over and something other in his ear. And like, I know cricket especially can take over like a whole. I know people who are that into yeah, cricket. They're, yeah. There are definitely people that into cricket. We also have Poirot's dentist. Yes. Bonnington. Besides, he likes to see the end product at work. What a great <laughs> line. But how, how, how does that happen? Like, I cannot imagine, and I like our dentist a lot, and we've been seeing him for a long time. Yeah. And I know a lot about him, and he knows a lot about us. I've had a lot of conversations with him. Even when I'm not on nitrous, I actually remember those conversations yes. and everything else. And I cannot imagine any of those conversations evolving into, let's have dinner. No. <laughs> it I, just wouldn't happen. I had the most interesting <laughs> dentist in the world in Toronto. Have I told you about this guy? No. So he was, um, so there in his office, there was a painting from a book by this guy named Guy Gabriel K. Now, why Guy Gabriel K is important is he worked with the Tolkien's on the Cimmerillion. Oh, so he's a Tolkien expert okay. at U of T. Okay. So I said, oh, that's the guy, Gabriel K. Fiona of our tapestry covers that you have there. He goes, yeah, that's the original. I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, me and Guy have been best friends all our lives. Wow. So he not only knew Guy Gabriel K., who was a very nice guy, I met him a couple of times, but was like, told, had great stories about, you know. And you never ask him out to dinner? No, I never. You never said, him. hey, let's go to a chop house? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you want to you wanna see my teeth in action? No. <laughs> <laughs> Roast beef without the mustard. <laughs> I love, so. So I, Molly is fantastic. I have seen all these episodes so many times, and I can tell you that next to Clapham Cook, this is the episode I know the most lines from by heart and i can like i can do molly's dialogue by heart she's fantastic she is so good yeah and and poirot is just feeding her lines because he wants to know he's yeah. actually intrigued yeah I right so. away yeah because he's the kind of person who little things like that that most people would just dismiss he knows that there's greater meaning to those things yes somebody who is like Henry Gascoigne, who is that entrenched in a routine, changing his routine means something. So I have a question. It's like Poirot having round toast and two eggs of very different sizes. Yes. People would be worried about him. Yep. Or if so, he showed up with dirty shoes on or something. So have you ever gone to a restaurant or a bar so often that you've had a, a usual? Yes. Okay. When I worked in publishing, there was a Chinese restaurant that we went to, to for lunch. Chengdu? Yes. This is weird. Because Sarah and I worked in the same neighborhood, but we did not know each other. No. This was we didn't almost meet for like, a half decade before yeah, we met each we didn't, other. We didn't meet for eight or nine years after that. Yeah. Um, but we went there so often for lunch when I was at work. We probably went two times a week sometimes because yeah. we would take stuff with us and work on stuff while we were eating. And, but the lunches were just numbers. Yeah. So after a while, the waitress would just come over and just point and say five, nine, 11, five. Yep. Ching, okay. Chengdu, this restaurant on the North side of Indy near the pyramids, anyone who ever worked in that area knows Chengdu and knows also that it was a miracle place mm -hmm. because it was Quick, cheap, good. Yeah. How is that possible? <laughs> but that's the only that's the only place uh, I can we, think of that I ever had a right. How about you? Um, I had a, a usual at this bar that I used to go to all the time in Waterloo. I go. I DJed there a couple of times. Uh, called Phil's grandson's place. I had a usual, which was because I was so poor. I had soda water. That was my usual. But did you ever actually say, I'll just have my usual? Yes. You actually did that? Yes. I've never said that. They they knew to give me soda water because so, <laughs> I was so cheap. <laughs> and eventually they just started giving it to me for free because it's just water with soda. In it. Yeah, it's just carbonated water. Yeah. Sparkling water. Yeah. Well, I drank a lot of it because I was very, very poor. Well, 
Henry never, never eats a thick soup. There's all those people in the restaurant. It's very busy in there. It's just so many people. Yeah. I'm just floored by the fact that a restaurant could have roast turkey as an entree. Yeah. Like, what's the logistics of that? How many turkeys did they make? They order so much food, too. They have an entire filet of fish for an appetizer. Yeah, wow. That's how things used to work back then. Um, but Poirot's tooth is still sensitive. But Gascoigne is there. Yes. But it's not. It's not. It's actually George. It's actually George. Because he orders the wrong thing again. But I love that Bonington says... So he says, knows None that of he your... goes to that restaurant all the time, but doesn't know what he what, orders. Or what days he goes. Because oh. he goes on the wrong day, too. He goes there twice. The uncle... He goes on the wrong day <laughs> yeah. as, like, practice. Yep. Right? So when he does that, his uncle is alive. Yes. <laughs> okay? And at home, it's just not his day to go to Bishop's. And he, also, can you be a recluse if you go somewhere outside the house regularly? I think so, if you if you don't speak to people when you do. I guess. Bonington says, there'll be none of your fancy French kickshaws here, Poirot. <laughs> Just good old-fashioned English fare. What are French kickshaw? A kickshaw is something that is um, a me- uh, food that is not substantial and overly fancy. Well, we'll I get, looked it up. We'll get to we'll get to Poirot's fancy meals. Mm-hmm. Why does he cook? No, <laughs> why is he cooking for for, for Hastings, Hastings when he can't eat? Yeah, uh, rabbit. Then we meet the best uh, ladies ever. The neighbors. The neighbors. Mrs. Mullen. Yes. Three bottles of milk. It's Pancake Day. <laughs> he hasn't had a bath since Pancake Day. <laughs> for they're a, perfect. They're wearing their pennies. Yep. They've they, still got pins in their hair. They are fantastic. For Americans who don't know, Pancake Day is Shrove Tuesday before uh, Mardi Gras, in which most of the sort of um, British Empire eats pancakes on that is day. Is it an Anglican thing? It could be an Anglican thing. because Ca- Catholics might have pancakes too. They may, but I know I was raised on it, and every once in a while I'll be like, oh, next week is Pancake Day, and we have pancakes for dinner. This so. is also a time... Where uh, another thing that amazes me uh, about the 1930s and a large period of time in UK history, especially when there were multiple mail deliveries every day. Yes. I don't understand that. Were so few people getting letters that they could do that or or were so many people getting letters that they had to do it? They had to do it. I can't imagine having multiple mail deliveries in a day. Well, think about it. If you had to send something across town and you had no fax or email or anything like that, you put it in the post. And it gets there in like two days. Yeah, but. (laughs) Or later today. Yeah, that's how it was. (laughs) Needless to say, how could they have been that efficient? Needless to say, this idea did not scale and did not work well on a national. <laughs> they had to stop eventually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's still amazing to me that there are still cities that have like morning and evening editions of a newspaper. Yeah, there's. I don't know if there are very any. few, but they are out there. So Henry's dead. They know it because he's got three bottles of milk on his porch. Yeah, two of which must be yogurt by now. Go get the men. <laughs> they bust down that door yep. and he's in a heap on his beautiful tile floor. Oh, it's so It's so beautiful. pretty. He's cold as ice. You're as cold as ice. So there's a scene of the crime and then the other non-dentistry thing happens where, yes, there's drilling and all the dangerous, horrible stuff at dentistry. And we could talk about dentistry, but my teeth already hurt because my sinuses are exploding. <laughs> but... <laughs> Not once has our dentist ever said, oh, you know that guy that we were talking about? He's dead now. Yeah. (laughs) But he does do the, I'm going to ask you a question and then tell you not to talk. Yes. (laughs) Is Paro's mouth propped open? I think so. I think it is too. And his hands, did you see his hands? He's like making fists and releasing fists over and over again. I'm like, oh. I can feel, I can feel the drilling. Yeah, it's so, Poirot has these metal things. It's propping his fi- yeah, mouth open. That's propping his mouth open. Ugh, I feel so bad for him at the dentist. Now, we kid, but I don't like the dentist, but I tend to fall asleep when I'm in a chair like that. It's like a possum reaction you have. <laughs> 
I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> but Poirot is off to investigate. Mm-hmm. I love how the washer lady <laughs> talks to him. As soon as he speaks, her name's Irene Mullen. Yeah. She says, oh, you're not from around here, are you? You're a foreigner. Yeah. And Hastings says he's Belgian. And from then on, she assumes he does not speak English, even though he just spoke to her. <laughs> Saturday. Saturday. He's very patient. Yeah. But Dulcie Lane, the model, is already up in the studio. She seems to be rifling through things. Well, okay. She knows what's up and knows that those paintings are going to be worth a bunch. Mm -hmm. And knows that she's the kind of woman that absolutely will be like, oh, I'm taking these three paintings and there's nothing you can say about it. Mm -hmm. Because poor O shouldn't be there either. No, no. But she's going through Henry's briefcase. Yeah. she She's looking for money and stuff to sell. As she should. Like She should? Well. <laughs> Who's going to get it? She's not going to get a lot of money from all those naked pictures of her. <laughs> Boy, Henry sure could paint a naked lady. Boy, could he paint a naked lady. There were two pins in a pot. What? <laughs> Meanwhile, Poirot whips out. Not a monocle, not a magnifying glass. It's a three lens magnifying glass yes. from his pocket. To look at the blotter. As well as a blade. Yes. Like an exacto knife. It's like his everyday carrier. Yes. Thing. <laughs> like, what else do you carry in your little vest? Your business card, your triple monocle. That doesn't make any sense. Tri trionicle? Try maybe. Because mono's one. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make any doesn't sense. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm just glad he it's didn't start looking at the naked pictures of her with, <laughs> with, with, with his magnifying glass. Yes. <laughs> but he's letting Hastings like distract her. Yeah. Because she's too busy going through stuff, trying to grab stuff. He's like, oh, I'm just going to cut a square out of this blotting pad. Nobody will notice me. She's confrontational. She's not rude. She's not mean. She's incredibly matter of fact. Yes. Which for a woman who spends her life being naked for pictures, is expected. I guess you have to be. Yeah. Yeah. But when she sits in that chair that she's clearly sat in nude modeling, yeah. she's being provocative. Yeah, totally. She's being confrontational then, yeah. I think. Poirot cannot accept that it was accidental, so he must go to the new forensics division. <laughs> it's the nerd team. <laughs> Poirot, yes, I. How many people in white coats are in that oh room? I counted gosh. at least seven. Yeah. And there's like a bubbling sound. Like there's clearly a Bunsen burner burning somewhere, somewhere. and something bubbling. Japs walking around. Japs walking around like, this is our new forensic unit. You know, if it was today, there would be like blinking light computer banks or yes. something. Computers. But instead there's... There's a, a magnifying glass and a, and a guy with some tweezers and a coat on a mannequin and people with test tubes. It's all the anoraks in one place. Yep. So he goes to see Cutter, the... the Incredibly blunt pathologist who just whips sheets off naked old men. Yes. That's good DB there. Yeah. Yeah. For a guy with no lines, he does pretty well. Yeah. Especially since they basically just... Flash everybody with his junk. Yep. He whips that sheet right off. Evidence, evidence, evidence. Weird rabbit in liege scene. Mm, you missed something. What did I miss? You missed the pathologist's office. Okay. Where he just lets Poirot take evidence. Yes. Though they've never met before. No. While he sits in front oh, yes. of his jar of floating bits. Oh, it's. The coloring is weird on that jar, too. It's like a, the water is like a pinky peach color. And, and there's, there's a bone in front of it. There's like bits floating around. We just keep around. bones around here. And floaty bits. Yeah. It's not even like a specimen jar. It's like a cookie jar yeah. full well, of floating stuff. The picture will be in the show notes, but wow. It's too grody. When he's talking, all I can go is, ew, what's in the jar? Like, he's got some medical posters. They work, but the but the, Why? Bone, the bone wand and concoction <laughs> jar. I just said it was his bit collection. His bit collection. His floating bit collection. And he's a pathologist named Cutter. Yes, I did notice that. Why don't they just call him Slice and Dice? Slice and Dice. 
Rabbit in Liège. Are you sitting down, Hastings? I'm coming. <laughs> I've got my really fancy smoking jacket on that I used to cook. Do not be stinting in your praise. <laughs> Poor Hastings. He's like, I just came over to eat. I don't. I didn't know I was gonna have to perform. Okay, if you go to somebody's house and they cook for you and they don't eat it, don't eat it. Don't eat it. <laughs> Especially if it has juniper berries in it. So I looked up lots of recipes that are supposedly liege in style. Okay. The leading one is the difference between a liege waffle and a Belgian waffle. Okay. That's a big one. Okay. But rabbit cooked in the style of liege most likely has the following ingredients in it. Okay. I like rabbit, so I'll see if I'll eat it. It is stewed rabbit in a sauce made of prunes. No. Onions, juniper berries, molasses, and vinegar. Oh, that sounds gross. If it's cooked real slow, all those flavors would meld together. It would have like a sweet, tart, I guess, oniony yeah. gravy. I think it might actually be okay. It might be. I don't like rabbit, though. It's too gamey. It I is. I don't like dark meat. Use your spoon. Do not insult the chef. While he's sitting eating his rabbit, which is rabbitier than any other rabbit he's ever eaten, <laughs> behind Hastings on the wall is a Picasso. Yes. It's a, it's a weird Picasso. To me, it looks like a conversation bubble dressed in a red jumpsuit playing piano. Yes. And that's pretty much what it looks like. Oh, with a flat dog. We'll, we'll put a link to it. But it's that's a, Picasso's it's, style. It's a painting from Picasso. Oh, that's interesting. Done in 1957. It's a time traveling oh, Picasso. Oh, time traveling red jumpsuit conversation bubble piano playing flat dog Picasso. <laughs> the dog at the bottom is particularly bad. <laughs> his eyes are on the same side of his head. That's Picasso, though. Yeah, that's his it style. Is, it is. But I would not have said, if you said, what kind, what artist do you think Poirot would like? Picasso would not have been on my list. No, it's it's weird that he has a, that Picasso particularly. I can see him having maybe. Especially many, since it hadn't been painted yet. Maybe old blind guitarist. I can see that. See, mm. I would have thought he was more of a um, pre-Raphaelite. Yeah, I could see that, too. Kind of classic. Yeah. But everything's 30s and wrongly dated. <laughs> <laughs> and tastes rabbitier than any other rabbit Rabbit-ier. you've ever had. So they go to the gallery. <laughs> and we have the typical, like, I'm staring at this painting and I don't understand it moment. Yes. But if Poirot likes Picasso, he, that shouldn't be too far off from him. for him. Yeah. When he goes to Paris for the tennis episode they talk about art in that episode Mm because they go to a museum Mm -hmm. i'm not sure he says he likes this stuff did you see the metal face yeah it's cool yeah there's a lot of cool art that that is obviously an actual gallery it looks like well and joan miro the artist that they say it's a a showing of was a real artist yeah he was he was spanish he was um from catalan i'll tell you what you're not going to do. What's going to happen is the director is going to say, let's have them go up this spiral staircase. Mm-hmm. And the audio guy is going to say, no. no. <laughs> How do I mic them and follow and the, them with the mic? And the camera guy is going to say, no. <laughs> and the director is going to say, no, I want them to go up this spiral staircase. Okay. Too bad. And later I'm going to make you film them in a rotunda. We'll make it. Work, I guess. Wow. (laughs) So Gascoigne wouldn't sell his paintings. Yeah. He would sell his sketches and small watercolors, but not his larger oil paintings. And I don't know. The world of art is weird, right? So perhaps by refusing to sell, it actually increased his cachet and the value of his paintings. That could happen, I guess. What could also happen is, well, then we don't care about his paintings and we're not going to care about his art. We're going to move on. It's implied that they're worth so much, but there's no real reason for it. Yeah. Plus, it's the 30s, and he's not a sort of modernist. Mm-hmm. He's a very traditional painter. Yeah. 
I can see all of his ladies have two eyes and two boobs and two legs. And, yep. you know, there's no flat dogs or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah. He's kind of old school. Yeah. Very- the, pa- the painting that is in um, uh, Makinson's office, his agent's office, is beautiful. And it it is, again, a very traditional painting. But that's the wife of the first brother. That's Charlotte. Yes. That's Anthony's wife. And then something happens that I'm upset about. Poirot hands him his card. Mm-hmm. And we don't get a, a shot of the card. No. Nope. And I'm upset. You'll just have to imagine what it is. It has red text on it. It what does. Do, what does it say? What does it say? I'm sure it's beautiful. Miss Lemon is listening to raffles on the radio. She is listening to raffles on the radio. Do you know about raffles? No. Okay. I know all about raffles. Okay. I was actually quite into raffles as a child. Oh, really? Which may not have been appropriate for me at that age. So raffles is written by E.W. Hornung, who was the brother-in-law of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Okay. And Raffles is the charming opposite of Sherlock Holmes. Okay. So he's a gentleman thief. Okay. By day, he is a gentleman cricket player. Okay. The best non-professional cricket player because being professional would be so oh, declassé. Would Raffles be on at this time? I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. So I've listened to the Raffles radio plays and they were in the 80s and 90s on the BBC. But CBS had a radio version of Raffles in the 1930s. So Miss Lemon would be listening to CBS. No. And I don't think she can be. No, she can't be listening to CBS. But she would certainly like Raffles because. He's a gentleman thief. He's very rakish and very whimsical and sardonic. And and is it like soap opera-y? Um, no, he's more like a modern highwayman. Like, oh, okay. he steals from very wealthy people who kind of deserve it. If you have the Apple TV, you should be watching the Dick Turpin. Yes. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> Let me get the exact title of this Dick the Turpin. The totally untrue stories of Dick Turpin. T- Isn't that it? Talk about Dick Turpin while I look this up. It's Noel Fielding who plays Dick Turpin. Um, from in like the first five minutes, we're like midsummer, midsummer, midsummer. Yeah. Everybody is in it. it. If you're a friend of Noel Fielding or been on in midsummer, you're in this show. You're in this show. Yeah. It's really funny. It's so clever. The completely made up adventures of Dick Turpin. Yeah. And in a strangely related way, I'm sorry, we're off on a tangent here, but it's really the gentleman as a half hour show. Because The Gentleman on Netflix is a, a new show that's based on a film by um, Guy Guy Ritchie. Yeah. is a show built based on a film by Guy Ritchie that we saw, but this is a series. Now, it's one of those great series where you're like, maybe I could be a criminal. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it's also, if you're Guy Ritchie's friend or been on Midsummer. <laughs> yeah, you're on The Gentleman. You're on The Gentleman. Yeah. Yeah, I recommend them both. Though I have to say, the Dick Turpin show is is so funny. It is. It is super clever. It is what the Black Sales wanted to be. Yeah, I don't know. That show was great too. It was good, but not not nearly as funny as this. Show. <laughs> but you should definitely go check it out if you've got yeah. Apple TV. Yeah. Um. Okay. Back to Raffles. Yes. So she could be listening to CBS radio. I don't, I could not find out whether CBS radio was accessible in the UK no, in the 1930s. Otherwise, this is another anachronism. Yeah. So they go to the art school to see Dulcie again. Yes. And she's modeling for a class in a rotunda. Yes. All right. And Hastings and Poirot go up to the second floor balcony that goes around the rotunda. Yes. And look down and see all of her nudie bits and the artists surrounding her. She is fully naked. But then there's a shot. The camera is in the rotunda filming up. Yep. And they're walking around and the camera is rotating with them. First of all, it made me feel a little bit sick. Just a little. Yep. And second, I was thinking, this is the echoiest room anybody has ever filmed anything in. The camera is a gazillion miles away from them. There's no boom mic in the shot. 
how how did they even do it and how annoying was it to film oh my gosh so it's not ADR this is I me being I, super nerdy I'm I sorry I double checked it's not ADR which means the audio wasn't recorded separately and put over it so they have to be wearing lapel mics which in 1989 would have had to have wires. Yeah, which we wouldn't see because they'd be on the floor, which we can't see because we're filming up. Yeah, but literally the sound guy and the camera guy after the the spiral staircase, spiral staircase were like, <laughs> now we're doing what? What? This is the echoiest room in the universe. They're built to be echoey, and now you want to film and what? It is so when you have a naked person on set, you usually have what's called a closed set, Mm -hmm. right? So it's a minimal crew, yes, to make the person as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. There's tons of extras in this scene. There's a whole art class standing around. Art class standing around, and so there's everybody has to work twice as hard because there there's no assistance, no nothing like that. Right? Like this was such a hard episode to film. Yeah. And almost unnecessarily so, because yeah. she could have easily have been draped in like a classical, like a toga. Yeah. And they could have been drawing her and it wouldn't have taken away from the shot at all. It's almost like somebody said, we want as many naked ladies in this episode as we can fit. What can we get away with? <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> to prove a point or something. I'm not against nudity. Don't get me wrong. It's fine. It's all fine. But... It, they're they're really they're pushing it and they're making it difficult for themselves by doing it. But they're also being so European in that oh well whatever it's naked people. Exactly, it's art, Mark. Yeah, it's really not nudity. It's art. Okay. Okay. Well, can we, we can't t- have naked ladies. Let's have a bunch of women in bikinis, <laughs> <laughs> dancing girls. Okay, let's talk about the actual crime and how it happened. <laughs> Because I've seen this episode at least five times, and I still am confused. I even tried to write a timeline this time. I love how... Of what, how George actually did it, and I'm still confused. I love how Poirot says, essentially, everyone's dead but the nephew, so he must have done it. And Dulcie has an alibi, and Mrs. Hill didn't do it. So it has to be George. He's the only other person. We're running out of suspects. (laughs) Okay, so the old man gets sick. The first Anthony. Anthony. Anthony lives in Brighton, and he gets sick. The the doctor says he's going to die. The housekeeper calls the nephew and says he's going to die. At this point, I can't come Henry till Sunday. is just fine. Yeah, I can't come till Sunday. Okay. Which is like the most, like, don't they do double shows on Sunday and Saturday? We don't know what day it is. Yep. Okay. It's earlier in the week. I can't come till later on. Anthony dies on Friday. So now Anthony dies. So the the housekeeper must call back and said he's dead. <sighs> no, you've got to rewind. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm writing this down. Okay. <laughs> so Anthony dies on Friday. Yep. Right. And George goes to Brighton on Sunday. All right. No. Yes. He goes to Brighton on Sunday. Yes. However, that's the. F- so she calls him earlier in the week and says he's not going to last till Sunday. Right. He's not going to last the end of the day. Yeah. Probably. Okay. So let's suppose she calls on Wednesday. Okay. Okay. What days does Henry usually go to the chop house? Isn't it Wednesday and Friday? I think it's Wednesday and Saturday. Wednesday. No, I think... Monday and Saturday? See, I think it's Saturday is the nephew. No, it is, but that's the second time he goes. (laughs) I'm probably lost. He goes twice. He goes once on the wrong day for Henry's schedule. Yes. And then he comes back the day that Poirot was there, which is Saturday. Okay. Okay. So on Saturday, Poirot sees him. Henry's already dead. So this has to be the next weekend. It can't be. (laughs) It can't be a whole week between when he dies and when they bury him. Maybe. 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 So the way I think it went down, and this is nuts, is that Mrs. Hill calls George on Wednesday. Yeah. Okay? It's still daylight. It's early in the day. Yeah. And says, your uncle's dying. He's not going to last. And Hen- and George immediately thinks, I got to go kill Henry. Yeah. So he observes, he knows Henry goes to the restaurant twice a week. So he dresses up that night and goes to the restaurant. 
which is not Henry's night to be there on Wednesday. As a dress rehearsal. As a dress rehearsal to see if he can pull it off. He does pull it off. So he kills Henry before Saturday when he would be going back to the restaurant on his normal schedule and goes to the restaurant dressed as Henry. And then gives all the clothing to the guy who works in the bathroom. he, he He leaves it in the bathroom after he changes and goes back to the theater. Why didn't he just go back to the house and ch- or the theater? Because <laughs> then somebody would have seen him coming out of the house. Maybe. They, he doesn't want anybody to see him yeah. come out of the house, right? Yeah. Now, how he got into the house to kill Henry and out of the house with nobody seeing him, I don't know. Because he must have. Because he had to shove him down the stairs. But the next day, Poirot goes to the house. Well, no. They don't know he's dead until the Sunday. So they get Monday's milk, Tuesday's milk. No, no. Poirot sees... But there's three <laughs> days... <laughs> See, this is how I'm confused because Poirot sees sees George dressed as Henry at the restaurant on Saturday and Henry's already dead. He's had lunch that day and died. Yeah. So George has killed him and then pretended to be him and gone to the restaurant. Then the next day he goes to Brighton. For the funeral. No. No, no. It can't the, funeral's, be for the, funeral. the funeral's not for a few more days. Because Poirot goes to the funeral. Right. That's not for a few more days. It's confusing. The timeline is not good. As near as I can tell, as soon as George finds out that Anthony is dying, he immediately decides to kill his other uncle. Why? To get the money. Okay, but his other uncle is as old. They're twins. Like, yes. Do, no, no. <laughs> Does he need money? Like, there's no implication that he needs money. There's no evidence that either of them were going to leave their money to him. No. There's just evidence that Anthony didn't have a will. So by default, everything he had would have gone to Henry. And maybe George knows Henry's leaving everything to him. Maybe. Because they did have some kind of relationship. So if Henry's will leaves everything to George, George isn't willing to wait for Henry to die, knowing he's going to inherit everything from Anthony. So he just takes him out so that they're both dead so he can inherit both of their stuff. Which would make him the prime suspect. Yes. And we have no signal of him being desperate for cash. No. The other question I have is why does Jap move the entire forensic unit to the theater? Oh, I don't... To be on stage. When Poirot <laughs> would explain this to Jap before this, the scene that we're missing. Yeah. Jap would go, mm, we could do that or we could just go arrest him right, right now, which is what I'm going to do. Because you have all of the clothing he was wearing when he was pretending to be Henry at the restaurant. Yeah. So let's just take it down to the forensics unit, have them look at it while we go and arrest him. Yeah. There we go. But no. Let's pack up all the nerds and all their equipment and take them to the theater and set up on the stage and put a dozen officers in the theater, even one on the spotlight. And this is a piece of paper from your typewriter in your office. (laughs) It's very confusing. When you're watching it, you're like, Oh, yeah, that all makes sense. No, it doesn't. But then when you try to, like, timeline it out, I I don't understand. Either Anthony was dead for a long time (laughs) or... Or George was like the fastest acting murderer ever. And like, did he have the old man suit ready just in case? Well, he works in the theater. All he had to do was go down to wardrobe. I guess. Right. And put on the stuff. It's so, I, I don't see a reason for the nephew to do it. I need a reason. He wants the money. Okay, I want, like, there's no implication that there's a huge amount of money. Right. Uh, there's Nobody says Anthony is incredibly wealthy. No. We know that Henry's estate is going to be worth some money. But not. But he must already be in line for that, and Henry's not going to live forever. Yeah. But apparently he can't wait. But it was another episode like Johnny Waverly where it was like, And the killer is you. Because it has to be. Because we've ruled everybody else out. But... It, that whole shebang does give Poirot and Hastings a reason to be creepy in a public bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> it's the cleanest public bathroom ever. That guy's office is in the bathroom. He just sits in a public bathroom all day and cleans yeah. it. 
That's awesome that they have such clean public bathrooms. I'm so glad he gives him money because I feel really bad for the bathroom attendant. Yeah. All he did was pick up some stuff that somebody left. He didn't do anything wrong. That's part kind of the perk of that job, you know, if there is a perk. Yeah, that's the only perk possible. Okay, forensics team, we're all going downtown to the theater. Yeah. Oh, we get to go to the theater. Yeah. We get to go somewhere. Bring all your equipment. <laughs> These Not are- only are there gorgeous posters at the seaside, they have some beautiful posters that were travel posters. They're railway posters in the background. But they're at the theater here at the end, there's some beautiful posters as well. I'm going to say that George doesn't have any friends at that theater because the guy who's polishing the brass works at the theater and is more than willing to cooperate with the police. He, he just went over there. No, that was him. <laughs> yep. yep, that was him. You should get him. You I'm can't just gonna... play Othello without blacking your face. A line that did not age well. No, no. <laughs> Maybe you could play Othello if you were a black person. <laughs> the closing scene at the restaurant yes. is both awesome and the most murder she wrote scene. Yes. <laughs> so we're back at the chop shop. Chop house. <laughs> Hastings, Jap, the dentist, and Poirot are having dinner. They're all eating their, their beef and mustard. <laughs> and Poirot does his cricket skit. <laughs> it's awesome. But I was I was almost waiting for the all four of them laughing freeze frame that the credits would be oh, on yeah. top of. That's so murder she wrote. That's what I meant. It was like, like this is dun, 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 but Poirot is awesome. Yes. Because he pretends not to understand cricket the whole time. Yeah. Because he finds it so incredibly boring and then just whips out all of the lingo. Yeah. It's, all so, at it's once. so fun. It is really fun. And if you if you watch the scene knowing that he's going to do it and you just look at the other three people at the table while he's talking, like Jap's eyes get bigger and bigger and Hastings' eyes get bigger and bigger and the dentist just looks like he's just more pleased. Yep. Like he's like, oh, that Poirot. And the other two are like, what is he saying? Oh my gosh, he knew all this all that the time. Wiley Poirot mm-hmm. and mustard. <laughs> He has flight variation, the Chinaman, and the most deadly quick of all that dips into a Yorker. Leg breakers and right handers. And he's doing this stuff with his hands, the voo voo with yep. his hands. And <laughs> he knows all the lingo. <laughs> Sticky wicket. Yep. Again, it's all the way up to a nine, at least. Yeah. Poiroiness. It's yep. so fun. Do not be stinting. I'm, I'm not going to say, Mom, Mom, I got a park, because there's a million people in this episode that so are So many Mom, people. Mom, I got a park. However, there is a horrible movie attached to this episode. Oh, there is. After the credits, the, the nephew gets goes called to, away. He goes to the to jail and um, doesn't get all the money. Who gets all the stuff? Uh, I've got a theory. Okay. So when they ask Dulcie if she understands the value of the paintings that she has, she says she will never sell them. And the way she says it is adamant. Yeah. Like, how dare you even think that I would sell them? I think she and Henry were close. Yeah. Not like romantically, but I think she oh, she think had a romantic. great respect for him, at least. And because other people wouldn't even put up with him. Yeah. Right? I Well, he hadn't taken a bath since painting. <laughs> I think that he probably left a lot to her. Yeah, I think so. And I think that George doesn't know that. Yeah, I think so. So she's going to make off with well, Luckily, once she shows two up estates. completely in the nude, she's forgotten <laughs> about completely. Well, she has auburn hair, you know. She can get away with whatever she wants. The, the, oh, she has an alibi. We don't need to talk about her anymore. No. <laughs> she has a beautiful robe. Yeah, she does. It's gorgeous. Are you ready for a horrible movie? I'm ready for a horrible movie. Hillary Mason, who plays Mrs. Hill, Anthony's housekeeper, okay. is in this movie. Okay. Produced in 1989. Okay. So same year. Mm-hmm. She's a working lady at mm-hmm. this point in time. The tagline for this movie, two men, two machines, too wild. You see the, the pun there? You see yeah. the wordplay? Do you want the summary? Yes. 
It's 50 years since the nuclear holocaust almost destroyed mankind. War is now outlawed. All territorial disputes between the great alliances are settled by single combat. At the Confederation playing fields in Siberia, a battle rages between two gigantic fighting machines piloted by their nation's champions. Wow. This is 89? Mm-hmm. Why did I not see this piece of crap? Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> Because it's in the future. This is Russia stuff. This is sci-fi. This is giant robots. Why did I not see this movie? Are you ready for the name of it? Yeah. It is called Robot Jocks. J-O-X. Jocks. Robo Jocks. <laughs> it's got two never giant fighting of, robots. I've never heard of this They're movie. fighting over who should control Alaska. Oh, my God. They're giant robots. That's that's just fantastic. Two men, two machines, two wild. Is there a star in this movie? Um, the guy, the leading man, he did a lot of TV. Okay. <clears throat> I can't tell you his name. Okay. You'll know him as soon as you see him. Okay. Robo job. That's one for me. That's, I can't believe you've never. I was like, oh, I don't know. This is definitely a Mark movie. It's called Robot Jocks. I yeah, mean, come Robot on. Jocks. He's I definitely seen this. Seen that movie. I win. You win. That is four and twenty blackbirds. So just again, we will be off next week because I will be in Indianapolis at the Indiana Comic Convention. If you want to stop by from wherever. Uh, I will be there uh, selling my comics. And then the week after, we will return with the third floor flat. Episode five, season one of Poirot. Poirot on the back staircase. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Life is just a bowl of cherries. All right. Until then, bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Look up Robot Jocks right now. Thanks for joining us on the Mystery Maniacs podcast. If you enjoyed our crazy podcast today, don't miss out on future episodes. Follow us on social media for updates, behind the scenes content, and exclusive sneak peeks. Subscribe, like, and share to spread the word. Bye, maniacs. Mostly, I just have how Poirot y this one is. Like, <laughs> it's very Poirot. It's so.